Welcome to the second video in the Getting the Most from Your Reading Six Steps to Success series. In the last video we shared the six steps to reading success and we talked about developing positive feelings about reading and developing a purpose for reading. In this session we're going to look at steps three and four. Step three is being a selective reader. The first step in being a selective reader is to remember the purpose of reading. So we talked about preparing for lectures and developing deeper understandings of texts, of identifying alternative perspectives and arguments and adding supportive data to our work. We don't want to read everything. We're going to try instead to select the most appropriate sources that can give us the information we need to answer specific questions. So one way to do this is to have a look at your subject outline and you'll find in your subject outline uh, a list of required readings or recommended readings and you can use these as a way of preparing for assessment and if you're really clear about the purpose of your reading you're more likely to uh, select appropriate text as well as being able to focus on the parts of the text that give you the informational answers that you want. We also need to read widely on a topic so we're not just going to read the text that you've been advised to by your lecturer. We know that successful students use the required and recommended readings as a starting point to do more research, to increase the understanding and the depth of the knowledge about a particular topic or theory um, or an idea or a practice or approach. So don't forget to look at the end of text citations of the recommended readings and use them to select other readings that might be of use to you. The third step is to be a smart reader. We need to know the difference between types of text. Books are seen as dealing with information that is accepted as fact on a topic, or uh, they include well-established theories or practices that have been built up over time. And so they're seen as providing more complete information, uh, such as context on an idea or historical perspectives, uh, causes and effects, long-term consequences, fuller and more in-depth explanations and conclusions, debates in the field and so on. And books publication dates are usually three or four years behind the most cutting-edge research which you tend to find in journals. So books tend to be more highly valued in disciplines such as the humanities and social sciences. Journal articles are vital for reporting seminal or cutting-edge or original competitive or time-sensitive research and therefore their publication date is as close as possible to the research that it is reporting. So we need to remember that journal articles date very quickly. So unless your discipline, profession, college, school or lecturer informs you otherwise, we generally confine our journal article reading to what has occurred in the last five or so years. We also need to remember that journal articles deal with a very narrow topic area and they're written for scholars and professionals. Journal articles carry more weight in the STEM, science, technology, and mass areas, disciplines and professions. Being a smart reader. To be a smart reader, we also need to use the knowledge in the text to help construct meaning and aid our reading. So in books, we understand that chapters build from the topic from the start of the chapter to the end. There are subheadings which help to focus on particular aspects of the topic, whereas research or journal articles pose a question and then answers that question through research. And so if we understand that the journal article typically follows a basic sequence, uh, it's easier to read. A common way of thinking about this is using the IMRAD, and this is Introduction, Methods, Results and Discussion. This can help us to focus on specific features of the study within that journal article. So we can use the structure of a text and its parts to aid our reading strategy. We can familiarize ourselves with the structure of the entire document and use this to focus on identifying answers to the questions that we've posed. We know the different patterns and types of paragraphs and one reading strategy for being a smart reader is to ask yourself, where would I find this kind of information? What part of the text might it be in? For our journal article example, 
Authors often state problem or the research question in the introduction. They state what they did to answer the question in the methods section. They state what they observed in the results section. And they discuss what they think it means in the discussion section. If we're reading a research article or a journal article, the first thing that we can do is read the abstract to get a quick overview of the entire paper. It's like a summary of what was done and it should include answers to the following question. What's the paper about? Why is it important? How did you do it? What did you find? And why are your findings important? It's typically a single paragraph of between 100 and 300 words. It's usually read first because it gives you a really quick overview of that study and whether or not it's interesting to you to read further. Next we look at the introduction and as implied the introduction introduces the paper and foregrounds the issues to be tested or under discussion. So the section covers the following essential elements. The overarching statement about the specific topic, some background information, the purpose of the paper, the thesis, and it will outline any key issues and give a scope. By beginning your reading with the introduction, and then the conclusion, in addition to the abstract, you're preparing your mind for the topic and you're readying yourself to locate the key facts and whatever information emerges about the topic. While you're reading the text, you should ask yourself, what is this paragraph saying about the overall topic? Generally, this is found in the topic sentence, which is usually the first or second phrase of the paragraph, and it should tell you what the main idea is about. We read on, to find more information about how this main idea is explained or supported. Another important feature of organizing ideas logically in a text is called cohesion. If you focus on finding the linkage or signpost words in the text that you're reading, you'll recognize how the ideas are organized and also what the relationship is between the ideas and how the message develops. We can only make sense of the content of a reading if it's organized in a logical way and takes the reader from the beginning to the end of the story with the relationship between each different part of the message made clear. Linking and signposting expressions make clear each of these steps and indicate a shift and a moving forward of ideas. Understanding this can help us to be a smart reader. Transition words are generally used at the start of a new sentence or a clause followed by a comma, signalling how this new information connects to or relates with the previous information. So transition words and phrases are used where and when needed. Authors are careful not to overuse these words because too much or too often can lessen the impact of the message or the argument, but they do help us to guide our reading. On the next slide we're going to look at an example of some transition. So take note of the following three slides and look at how the authors are using common conjunctions or cohesive devices, transitions or signposting words in context. In this example the first word despite is used to introduce an opposite idea or to show exception or concession to something. The conjunction AND in example B is showing us that the author is adding another idea or more information. In example C, the phrase FOR EXAMPLE shows us where the author is giving us an example to support their idea. Example D, using the word AND and OR, the author is introducing an opposite idea or to show an exception or concession. In example E, the author is adding another idea or information and they're doing the same in example F. In example G by using the phrase such as we can see the author is giving an example. In this paragraph example you can also see transitions being used. Example A is used to indicate a result or cause and effect. B to add another idea or more information. C to compare. D to refer to and emphasize a specific incident or example, E to add another idea or more information, F to add another idea or more information, G to emphasize or indicate importance, H to indicate time, I to contrast, and J to indicate result or cause and effect. In the third example, you can see that the transition words in A are used to indicate sequences or logically order ideas, B to indicate result or cause and effect, C to add another idea or more information, D to indicate result or cause and effect, E to give an example, 
and F to introduce a comparable or related idea. Here are some links to online resources. They comprise information and lists, examples and activities related to conjunctions, cohesive devices, transitions or signposting words or phrases. Another thing to know about being a smart reader is that every paragraph must have a topic or theme, it must include evidence with references, and it must have a conclusion when an author is making an argument or adopting a position. In this example paragraph, the topic sentence expresses what the paragraph is about. 